Welcome today to today's talk. Um, on behalf of the Center for Historical Research in the Department of History and its co-sponsors today, the Department of Philosophy, the Center for Ethics and Human Values, and the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, welcome to the, today's uh, talk in the CHR's interdisciplinary series on anger in history. It's a two-year series that explores a variety of perspectives on how anger has shaped and continues to shape societies. So we're so pleased today to have with us Professor Owen Flanagan, the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Philosophy and Neurobiology um, at Duke University. Uh, his work spans the philosophy of mind and psychiatry, ethics, moral psychology, and cross-cultural philosophy. Uh, the recipient of numerous awards and uh, honors, too many to recount here, uh, Professor Flanagan has lectured on every continent except Antarctica, uh, his, although his website says uh, he visited Antarctica, um, and he's consulted with important thought leaders uh, like the Pope and the Dalai Lama, and uh, today we had lunch. Um, <laughs> He's the author of many books, including uh, Varieties of Moral Personality, uh, Ethics and Psychological Realism, uh, Self-Expressions, Mind, Morals, and the Meaning of Life, The Really Hard Problem, Meaning in a Material World, I'm going to go with a few more, The Bodhisattva's Brain, Buddhism Naturalized, The Geography of Morals, Varieties of Moral Possibility, and most recently, How to Do Things with Emotions, Anger and Shame Across Cultures. Meanwhile, two edited volumes by others have been dedicated to his work. Um, and in recent years, he was the principal in the Ethics in Action Initiative uh, with the Vatican, working closely with Jeff Sachs on questions about well-being and sustainable development. So uh, it's really an honor to have him here today um, in uh, Central Ohio. Um, uh, Professor Flanagan's talk will be on Our Angry Times, uh, Can the Humanities Help? And so please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Uh, I was really happy to be invited to uh, this series because I've been thinking about uh, the topic for a while. So uh, I felt uh, the stars were aligned. Um, uh, this talk is really, uh, before I start, I just want to say, uh, I'm trying to pitch this talk uh, to a general audience of uh, uh, both students and faculty and to try to make it an invitation across the disciplines, which is why I added this subtitle, uh, Can the Humanities Help? Uh, you know, it's, these are interesting times for uh, the liberal arts and the humanities in general. Uh, people want to know about what, are, what is the value added. <laughs> Um, given that they suspect we don't produce uh, pupils who get jobs right away, at least in history or philosophy, without lots of extra training. But I thought it, was, uh, it would be useful to sort of reflect on whether or not um, the different disciplines I'll talk about today, I'll primarily be talking from the point of view of philosophy, of course, because that's where I'm mostly ha homed, housed, but also from the point of view of psychology and uh, cognitive neuroscience to a certain extent. Um, but I'm interested in whether or not, for example, uh, given the topic of this seminar, that there are, there's some kind of issue going on with anger, some people think. Um, what can the humanities help us? Can the humanities help us um, with that problem? Uh, the, the topic of today's talk, in some ways, it snuck up on me. Um, in some respects, it also grew organically out of long-standing interests in the philosophy of mind, ethics, moral psychology, and cross-cultural philosophy on the nature and function of the emotions. But it also responds to a persistent practical worry I've had throughout the first two and a half decades, uh, two decades of the 21st century, especially the last decade, and that I found myself talking about to family students and friends. I've never lived in angrier times. I've lived in fraud and bloody times before. I was 13 in September 1963 when four innocent black girls were killed by a bomb at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Two months later, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. I was 15 in 1965 when Malcolm X was killed, 18 in 1968 when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. The year 1967 was the summer of love in Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, and also the summer of 159 race riots from Watts to LA to Detroit to Newark. On May 4th, 1970, one month before I graduated from college, 
28 members of the Ohio National Guard fired 67 rounds in 13 seconds at anti-war protesters at Kent State University, killing four students, injuring nine others, paralyzing one for life. I was a young man throughout the 70s, which many say, and I agree, were transformative times. In the 1960s and 70s were a time of passionate causes, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights. The Stonewall Uprising was in 1969. And ending the unjust war in Southeast Asia, which we discovered had extended into Laos and Cambodia and was no longer the Vietnam War. There was anger and there was blood. But one, seemed, one sensed at the time that they were both in the service of hope. Our time seemed angrier than that time, but also mostly absent high ideals and hopes. Our anger is fierce and frantic, but not at the same time ameliorative. Politics especially is a zone where the communal spirit, patient listening, and public reasoning of the New England town meeting is a quaint memory, replaced by politics as the expression and performance of resentment and disgust. I started to wonder how we could turn down the temperature and anger on both the left and the right as a way of making more room for hope, idealism, and solidarity. But I was met again and again with people on all sides who explained that the anger I was seeing was rational and normal. I found myself explaining that it might be statistically normal here and at this moment, but it wasn't statistically normal over the earth and over time. And it wasn't normatively normal. It wasn't good. I found myself going to sources outside my own tradition for examples of philosophers or saints or exemplars or whole traditions that offered arguments against being as angry as we were, even in the service of noble ends. It suits my view, although it makes me sad, that Bob Woodward entitles his book on the Trump presidency, Rage. Rage names both President Trump's character and modus operandi and the current state of American social psychology. So I've just said this, you know, uh, and, and, and of course you might say this is about all the history that appears in my talk. It's about my personal history. But then again, I've been around the block. I'm old. I'm, you know, some people say I'm in the fourth quarter of life. Maybe I can put it that way, uh, right? Or pre-dead, as some people say. But um, so you may not share my personal observation uh, about this, but at least in talking about it over the last few years, there are enough people in my age group who grew up in America who, who at least sort to feel uh, something that I'm onto something here, not that I'm the only person who ever said it. So as I said, the, uh, what uh, uh, Pankaj Mishra calls the our age of anger. Um, so my major point here is that, uh, as I say, the late 60s and 70s were angry times, uh, but there was hope, idealism, and good role models. Today's anger seems sloppy, vengeful, self-centered, nihilistic, not idealist, not idealistic, and politics is a performance of resentment and retribution. You might say, well, maybe that'll go away. But the trouble with, with social trends and social contagion is that children catch on to the norms and the scripts that they see in public life. They see, what they see on TV, what they see in their households, what they see when in commercial relations uh, becomes um, uh, uh, part and parcel of the way they then learn to do things. There are some recent data, OK? Uh, and again, this is an invitation to think across the disciplines. So. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested in what uh, empirical sciences say. So here's some recent data. I'll just read them. 84% of uh, Americans say that we're angrier than a generation ago. That's where a generation is 20 to 30 years ago. And note, they've been saying this for more than a generation. Okay, so pe this trend is sort of uh, people are feeling it that there's that the anger is out of control. 30% of people say they're often angry when reading the news. It probably is higher this week. Um, uh, but that's a lot, 30% who are angry watching the news. 20% of young people say they're often angry when using social media. And 90% of people say they are more likely to express anger on social media than in person. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm sure in the discussion period, people will want to talk about uh, social media. And um, I do think that there are some really um, enabling causes uh, going on in that zone of life. Everything from the fact that people are invited on social media to make assertions, not to give arguments, uh, to stamp their feet, whatever the number of uh, digits, you, whatever number of letters you get is 
very short, so there's not an invitation to uh, open a conversation and then to have back and forth. But these are the kind of uh, general statistics. Now, as I, uh, what I found when I said to people uh, that I about my observation about our angry times, uh, one is often met with a view of anger uh, or emotions in general, which I think is implausible. And this is one case where the humanities can help. So many people will say, "Oh, yeah, people are really pissed off. Everybody's pissed off." When I first started to do this, people, uh, my friends, of course, are on the left. Not of course, but that's what professors do. <laughs> um, and I say things like, aren't, aren't people angry? And they say, those scumbags on the right, they are really angry. And I say, look at yourself in a mirror. I mean, it just uh, it, so it, it's, 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 it was everywhere. But many people will say, well, the anger is we're doing it. I mean, there's, people are so angry. But that's because na anger is a natural ballistic reaction to states of affairs that trigger it. On this view, this is a view that, that emotions are like reflexes. If I hit my funny bone, it's going to feel like a funny bone hit. If a doctor hits me on the knee, that knee reflex will work. If my, if my pupils hit light, then they'll contract, and so on and so forth. Um, so the picture is that that emotions are like that, and therefore, in the second view, second sort of, these are not an argument, these are just separate points. So we can't help but feel anger and other emotions as we do. Now this blends in, I call this authenticity or enlightenment. So some of the elders in the room who were around during the same late 60s that I was talking about uh, would have been around for a cultural period in which we started to learn that authenticity involved expressing who you are in your sort of deepest ways and you have permission to do that okay so if so if there's a dispute about how one ought to feel in a certain certain situation each party is allowed to just say this is how i authentically experience the situation this is how i authentically feel and that gives i think a certain kind of entitlement or permission uh, that doesn't behoove us uh, with all the emotions there are some emotions which you should sometimes work against experiencing Okay, so if always feeling sort of entitled or that your authentic self should come out and everybody should see your authentic self, there's some parts of my authentic self I don't want you to see and there's probably parts of your authentic self that you don't want to express or have me see. So I think this is, but this was a, this is a sort of a zeitgeisty thing. Um, and then there's a view also around the same time uh, when we had primal screen therapy, that was something I won't go into, but um, <laughs> that it's good and healthy to vent your emotions. So if you have negative emotions, you should vent them. So of course, and you see this, this is just, this has become a sort of a part and parcel of a kind of popular cultural ideal where being honest involves expressing how you are feeling about things and your legitimate, that's a legitimate desire to have. Um, and then, um, uh, okay, and then, so the, one of the reasons for the predicament though, as I said at the beginning, is that I think of all the emotions, I mean, you might want to think of emotions as sort of coming with the equipment. Some people do talk about basic emotions. I'm not opposed to that. There are some basic emotions, it looks like. But basically almost, but I think that most of the emotions that interest us are normed and scripted. They have lots and lots of cultural aspects to them that might surprise you. And I'm gonna to try to bring out some of those cultural aspects today that govern our anger practices. But the main point here of number four is just that whatever the anger practices are in a culture, the, the, the young people will catch on to them and reproduce them. Okay, kids are imitators. Okay, so my question then sort of becomes for today, um, if I'm right that there's this problem with anger, can philosophy and the other humanities, I'm including the human sciences here too, sociology, anthropology, history, um, can they help us uh, think and do better psychologically and morally uh, um, when we're not doing well, which maybe we're not doing well right now? And then and the question, other questions are like these. Can scholarship and teaching have any good effects on cultural practices such as the way we enact anger and could the liberal arts make any difference at all uh, when emotional norms are going uh, emotional or moral norms are going badly or awry I can talk later on about the distinction between um, the sort of psychological and moral what I have in mind there just it could be good for you let's just say psychologically for you to vent your emotions but it might not be morally appropriate to do so okay that's what I have in mind so there might be costs uh, to morality now and these are this, this. This is some of the work that I've discussed. What I'm talking about today in this work. Now, I take one of my one of my um, um, dear friends, and he's now 94 years old, uh, Alistair McIntyre, 
um, at his 80th birthday party in Dublin. I happened to be there. Uh, and he gave a talk uh, 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 called On Having Survived the Academic Moral Philosophy of the 20th Century. <laughs> um, and in it, he said this, which I, I like this quote and it inspires me. And it will give you a, a little bit of a picture of the rest of the talk. He says this, contemporary academic moral philosophy turns out to be seriously defective as a form of rational inquiry. How so? First, the study of moral philosophy has been divorced from the study of morality. We do not expect serious work in the philosophy of physics from students who have never studied physics, but there is not even a hint of a suggestion that courses in social and cultural anthropology and in certain areas of sociology and psychology should be a prerequisite for graduate work in moral philosophy. Yet without such courses, no adequate sense of the varieties of moral possibility can be acquired. One remains imprisoned by one's own upbringing. Now, I just want you to focus here on two, uh, two ideas. Varieties of moral possibility. So if emotions are ballistic, if they just sort of, uh, there's just a stimuli which activates the reflex, then it's not very interesting to talk about doing them differently. You can't control your pupil contractions. You can't control uh, your reflexes. However, if there are cultures or subcultures that are doing better with an emotion that you are also, as it were, executing in everyday life, and you can find them or find traditions which have wisdom about your topic, you might be able to see ways in which you could modify the ways you're doing things. You know, in the simplest way I put it, I'm not very happy with this, in the book I often say things like, turn down the temperature on anger. That's not very helpful, but that's part of the idea. <laughs> so you might just say, boy, we're all too angry all the time, we're not listening to each other, what could we do? One answer would be, you can't do much of anything, that's the way anger works. Another idea is, no, there's huge amount of plasticity in how we do the emotions, and so we could do them differently. So I invite you to think that way. Now. Um, uh, one of the things I, do, uh, I don't need to talk about the first thing here, but I guess one thing I just wanted to, um, uh, in following McIntyre, point out, this is number two. Um, the, um, so one of the things that philosophers often do, I do this all the time in my own work, is you want to know as best you can something like the answer to this question. What is human nature like deep down inside beneath the clothes of culture? If you could know it, that would be terrific, right? What is human nature like deep down inside beneath the clothes of culture? That would be great if you could know it. But you can't, there's no such thing. We're all cultured. So what you can do is uh, look around at different cultures to figure out what human nature is like. Now what I think is the most important paper published in the last, actually in this century, in psychology is a paper called The Weirdest People in the World. Do people know this paper? Well, I invite you to I invite you to read it. Um, uh, what happens? So I've been always appointed in philosophy departments and also in psychology and neuroscience because of some weird interests of mine. Um, and uh, if you're ever around psychologists, you know that they all work, they always talk about the following problem. We better it better be the case that North American college sophomores are representatives. <laughs> because most psychology is based on North American college students. Um, now, so what uh, Joe Henrich and these other people did was they said, okay, first we're gonna do an empirical study. We're gonna study number one, what percentage of articles in the top psychology journals are about North American college sophomores? Over 90%. Question number two, how representative are North American college sophomores? The Flintstones are more representative, cave people, because we have the following properties. We're Western, we're educated, we're industrialized, we're rich, and we're democratic. Those properties, m many of them, the democratic one is new, rich is new, industrialized is new. Okay, remember, I mean, so the idea here is that we are the least representative <laughs> group of people to, to start to claim, make claims about universal human nature on. Okay, we're just not a good 
uh, uh, method. Now, what that means, though, is that you got to look outside. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about um, two sources of evidence from cross-cultural psychology and other human sciences and some from cross-cultural philosophy that might make you sort of engage in this McIntyrean exercise of thinking about other ways to do anger, that's our topic, remember, <laughs> that might be more healthy for us, but that we're not doing yet. Okay? Because sometimes it's hard to get out of a rut when you're in it yourself. Okay? So this is the idea. So this is like my contribution maybe to how the humanities can help. You, you, look, you look outside. Now, um, the, um, if you go, so one thing to do is just to go back historically and think about um, uh, what, what our tradition, and this is what I, on the previous slide, I had the so-called footnotes to Plato lineage. I, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, um, uh, an important philosopher, I think it was in the 1920s at Harvard, he, he uh, made a statement that, um, the, this is the quote, the safest generalization to make about Western philosophy is that it's but a series of footnotes to Plato. That's not quite right, but you know what I mean? But the idea is that you get Plato and Aristotle, and then you get the greats of European philosophy comes to America. So you have, you know, you have the great philosophers, when you list them, are all dealing with a sort of a lineage. They're a lineage of a set of ways of thinking about the world. Now, one of the people that shows up in our lineage, of course, is Aristotle. And a lot of the Western philosophical discussions of anger relate to what Aristotle says. So this is Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, he says this, anger may be defined as a desire accompanied by pain. The accompanied by pain part just means it's a negative, it has negative valence, to use the language that psychologists use. So when you're angry, it's unpleasant, at least at first, the feeling, something like that. Accompanied by pain for a conspicuous revenge. Notice, this is interesting, right? It's anger for Aristotle is a disposition that has explicitly the desire for a conspicuous revenge. And then he tells you why you might want conspicu conspicuous revenge. On account of a perceived slight belittlement on the part of people who are not fit to slight one or one's own. Now there's an awful lot going in that, in that sentence, right? But it's quite, uh, I mean, it's quite interesting because it has to do with sort of idea that that certain people might not be, certain people might want to get uppity around me, but there certain people don't have permission to get uppity, right? That's the idea here. And Aristotle distinguishes, well, actually, he talks about three different ways in which you can, um, a person who's not positioned to question my status could do so. You might express contempt for me. You just, that would be one way to, another way would be um, to talk down to me. A third way would be spite. So I have M&Ms, I don't really want them anymore, you want them, but I throw them away. These are all reason, good reasons to get angry for Aristotle. But the idea, so th this, is a, this, is, this part is from the uh, rhetoric, not from the uh, Nicomachean Ethics. And he continues to say this, a person who doesn't enact payback anger, Payback anger is a technical term in some of the philosophical work I work in. So it's related to this revenge idea. Nussbaum uses it, I use it, I forget who else uses it. So he says this, a person who doesn't enact payback anger, he has views about proportionality. Okay. Uh, we would consider servile and stupid. Okay, so this is just, I mean, he's a philosopher. He's an important philosopher. He sets up, uh, uh, I mean, he's thought to be in the Middle Ages, of course, by people like Aquinas, the philosopher. Okay, but he sort of sets out for us this idea that at least there's one kind of anger that's permissible. And in fact, if you don't get angry in this way and try to get hurt people back, if they've hurt you, then you're servile and stupid. Now, <clears throat> Aquinas comes along, and uh, <clears throat> this is now the 12th or 13th century, and uh, he ups the standards a little bit for what is virtuous anger. Virtuous anger for Aristotle is the kind that I just talked about. Um, for, for Aquinas, uh, anger, now he's using a different word from Aristotle. I could get into, we might, there might be questions about the different language in the question period, but it's a virtuous anger is a desire to make the other suffer. So again, he thinks anger has that aim to hurt, but you should only do it if you could imagine God also punishing that person for what they just did. <laughs> 
Now, this requires a whole complicated relation to a sort of God, God's thoughts, and so on and so forth. But it kind of does up the ante. At least you want to say, well, you shouldn't just get revenge for any old, you know, just a little reason, right? You should have something like a really good reason, such that God thinks that the person should suffer. So in both these analyses, we have anger, Payback anger is authorized if it's done, again, in the right way. And Aristotle, of course, we know from Aristotle, Aristotle would say, you know, you have to do everything according to a doctrine of the mean, neither excessively or defectively. So there's room for that. But inside philosophy, there's lots of disagreement. So um, in the third century, from the third to the second century of the Common Era, Stoics came along, and Seneca in particular um, goes after Aristotle. Now this is interesting because you probably know that the Stoics are famous for having great armies. So one of the things that of course is important in thinking about anger is separating out things like anger, aggression, violence. They might go together, but they might not. We'll talk about that later. But Seneca has a famous letter called De Ira on anger. And he says that according to the Stoics, Anger should be extirpated root and branch. He says, Aristotle stands for domesticating anger. Like that is, you're gonna treat it like a plant or an animal that you're going to like, like the horse that you need to learn to, to, to domesticate so you can ride it. Or the uh, dog that you need to make sure it does its thing in the proper places, outdoors, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, Seneca says, Aristotle thinks that can happen. He says, but anger shows no, doesn't show that it can be domesticated doesn't show that it can be domesticated. He says things like this. He says, um, the trouble with anger, and I ask you to reflect on personal experience, he says, it always gets fussed up about the things on the outside. And he gives examples that mean something like this. So I get mad at Pierce for not doing his chores today. And we get into a struggle, and we're going back and forth over it, and we're both saying more than we want to. And eventually I say, where do you get those ridiculous glasses? Or I remember something he did 12 years ago. It gets involved in the outskirts of things. It can't keep its focus. So Seneca is worried for you. Now, the Seneca in his idea that it should be extirpated root and branch, he actually, you might say, well, that's puzzling because they're great warriors. He says, yeah. He says, Stoic soldiers win battles. Angry armies rape and pillage. Stoics would never do that. We just win battles. Now you might, there's some people find this kind of antiseptic and sort of like Spockian, you know, uh, just to kind of emotionally disengage. But the Stoics had really powerful um, thoughts about um, uh, the, uh, the way in which anger just causes, uh, causes trouble and also that ethics should never aim to make someone suffer. So that's the argument against payback anger for the Stoics. They say ethics has the good of the other uh, as its aim, but if you try to get revenge on someone, it's not their good that you're aiming at. You're aiming to hurt them. Stoics are very interesting. I, I can't go, I, I, I'm happy to answer questions later on, but I often think, um, recently I was at a uh, coffee shop and I was sitting on the side and there was a long line of students between a class. This is not here and this is not a Duke. Uh, another university, <clears throat> and I saw the line, this woman in the line was getting really upset about the length of the line and I could just feel it, you know, and I just, She's tensing up, and then, you know, and she's looking at her friends over here, and she's going, oh. And then the guy in front of her, at the very end, you know, he orders like a triple macchiato with Antiguan virgin <laughs> shavings, and then he wants to pay by check, and she's steaming. And then she finally gets through, and then she comes over to her friends who happen to be sitting next to me, and she says, you want to leave? What happened to me? And they all hug her. And I'm thinking, you're acting like her mother died. <laughs> It really wasn't bad. <laughs> and what the Stoics say is in situations like that, you repeat to yourself things like, be indifferent to indifferent things. Just get over yourself. Or study astronomy. Why astronomy? Get over yourself. 
Okay, so these these were, as Martha Nussbaum will always say, these were therapists of desire, but they weren't. The idea wasn't this will be simple. It's just that when something causes this much trouble, you don't have to do it. And of course, we'd say, you know, just because these things we say nowadays, just because these emotions have evolved and serve a biological function, that doesn't mean they also serve a moral function. They might or might not. It depends. Okay. Um, Buddhism is also a, um, uh, a major area. So Buddhism and Stoicism are the two greatest traditions, two great traditions, which are both a limitivist about anger. And when I say a limitivist about anger, they both think you should extirpate it root and branch. It does no good. So let me just now tell you a story um, uh, uh, about uh, time in 2000 when I was in Dharamsala. So here's a true story that was pivotal in my own exposure to alternative moral possibility spaces and that provoked my imagination. In March 2000, I visited Dharamsala, India for four days of meetings with the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, and some of his fellow Buddhists and a group of Western scientists, mostly psychologists and neuroscientists, to discuss the topic of, quote, destructive emotions and how to overcome them. Daniel De Goldman's book on these meetings with that title is a good report. There was much to learn in these discussions in the Dalai Lama's residence and many surprises. Here is an unforgettable one. It became clear after a day or so of talks that Tibetan Buddhists believe that anger, resentment, and their sweet are categorically bad, always unwarranted, wrong, unwholesome as they are inclined to say. This was surprising by itself. We have many norms for appropriate anger, such as don't get too angry, or so angry as we sometimes say. And wrath is a deadly sin, but we do not think that one should never get angry, that anger is always wrong. For us, the right kind of anger reveals that one sees and cares about something of value. Every day not so warranted anger shows that one is normal. Minimally, we expect and tolerate a certain amount of it. But then there was this kicker, even more mind-boggling. These Buddhists also believe that anger could be eliminated in morals, in mortals. That there are practices that actually work so that it is possible to not experience anger. Practices that can extirpate anger, cleanse the soul of tendencies to anger. I got that there are practices and rules of decorum, counting to 10, sublimation, or stuffing it, norms of apt anger that keep us from expressing anger and that work to contain it. But not experiencing anger at all seemed unnatural, weird, not human. Again, self-work to keep from getting pissy over small frustrations makes good sense and is possible. But except for a rare saintly bird of maximally even temperament, not experiencing anger at the cosmos or at the gods for the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and especially at evil people for their awfulness, seem close to a psychological impossibility. Then there is the fact that most people I know were raised to think it is okay, permissible, possibly sometimes required to feel and express outrage. Righteous anger is something we ought sometimes to experience and express, something that certain people or states of affairs deserve. So I found myself posing this thought experiment to the Dalai Lama. Imagine that one were to find oneself in a public space, a park, a movie theater, where one realizes that one is seated next to Hitler, or Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, pick your favorite evil person. Early in the execution of the genocides they actually perpetrated. We, I said, my people, think it would be appropriate first to feel moral anger, possibly outrage at Hitler and the others, and second, that it would be okay, possibly required, to kill them, supposing one had the means. What about you Tibetan Buddhists? The Dalai Lama could turn to consult the high lamas who were normally seated behind him, like a lion's pride. After a few minutes of whispered conversation in Tibetan with his team, the Dalai Lama turned back to our group and explained that one should kill Hitler. Actually, he said, it was sort of swashbuckling the way he said it. You should kill Hitler, and he sort of waved around to mix metaphors like a samurai warrior beheading him. Thought that was interesting. You should kill Hitler, he said. 
because you're stopping a very bad karmic chain. So yes, kill him, but don't be angry. Love him. What could this mean? How did it make sense to think of one human being killing another, being motivated to kill another human being without feeling, without activating the suite of reflective attitudes such as anger, resentment, and blame? I'm happy to discuss the example later on in the Q&A because you're, you're probably interested. In both cases of Buddhism and um, Stoicism, there are background metaphysical views that make sense of this. I mean, one of the, basically the view about Hitler is something like this for the Buddhists. Hitler is a bad note in the way the universe is unfolding. He's very unfortunate. You're stopping him from doing even worse is an act of charity and good for the world. Okay, but then they'll add this. He will be, he will be your mother and your child. Hitler will be your mother and child. This has to do with a background metaphysical view about every concatenation of the way things are is repeated an infinite number of times. So you actually will be in that relation. But putting that aside, so it's very different from someone saying, you should be nicer to that pupil. Remember, you have a son who has the same learning difficulties. You know, someone say that. Yeah, they just mean, put yourself in the shoes. No, they, here they mean, <laughs> you really will stand in this relation of being a beloved to this individual. Now you might say, well, that metaphysics isn't one we have, but it shows at least that it's possible to have background views that could change your entire orientation and judgment about a certain emotion. That's really the point here. Now, um, another thing uh, to add, so th those, are, those are two philosophical sources, Stoicism and Buddhism. Uh, they're, and they're actually very easy in terms of how the humanities can help. They're very short. Seneca's De Ira is not long. You can read it for a class, and the students can read it for a class. It's very provocative, uh, and uh, it's very challenging. Um, the, Bodhisatt the, um, the Buddhist text is by Shanti Deva, who's a um, eighth century Tibetan Buddhist in, in book six of his The Bodhisattva's Way of Life. The Bodhisattva is a Buddhist saint. It's all about anger and controlling anger in roughly the ways I just said. Okay, so those are some, those are some examinations of the possibility space inside philosophy that one could go to. What, can you, what about from other cultures? So this is Bacha Mesquita, who's a, uh, I think really the best person right now doing cross-cultural work on the emotions. She's, at, she's Dutch, she's out of Belgium, she's taught in the United States for a long time. Um, but her general uh, finding in this book and all her papers is that there's huge cultural variation in terms of how people do all the different emotions. So I wanted to show you some findings uh, just to think about how right now on earth, forget about Buddhists and Stoics, people in different nation states do the emotions differently. So let me just uh, start up here. Actually, uh, uh, so when you do free association tasks, um, you just and find out what people associate with the word anger. Americans associate anger with yelling, shouting, and hitting. Those are the top three things that Americans freely associate. So the idea is that these are conceptually or semantically related in the way we see our world. And in fact, uh, Americans are interesting because if you ask Americans, uh, uh, what do you want to do when you get angry at someone? Does anyone have on to blurt out an answer? What do you want to do when you feel angry at someone? You don't do it usually. Punch them. Punch Punch him in the face. That's the number one American one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being courageous. Um, now that's interesting, right? Because that so because if you think of emotions as individuated, as we say, how as as in terms of the things that cause them, how they feel innerly, and then what you want to do, which you don't always do, luckily. Okay. Punch, wanting to punch someone in the face is kind of an interesting <laughs> thought. Now, in American psychology books, you'll read that anger is an approach emotion. That is, we want to go after someone who makes us angry. But if you look over here, if you do associations with, for Belgians and Japanese, anger is associated with ignoring and withdrawing. And Japanese people in particular will say, when they're asked, what do you want to do when you're angry? They say, I want to leave the room. 
it's very interesting. So the whole taxonomy in psychology departments and psychology textbooks that anger is an approach emotion, it is where you come from. It's not everywhere in the world. And this relates to how mothers, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the fathers being out of this is just they didn't study the fathers. It's easier to find the mothers and the children. So over here where you say, how do people respond in different countries when kids are angry? And the finding is that US and German mothers escalate anger. When a kid gets angry, the mother gets angry back, and it escalates until there's either mutual exhaustion or something like that. <laughs> okay? But it's an escalatory thing. Japanese mothers respond with disappointment and sadness. They never engage with anger. I shouldn't say never, but you get the idea. These are generalizations. But this is quite interesting, right? Because it just shows you that even without exotic metaphysical theorizing like the way Stoics and Buddhists were doing, you can just get cultural variation in how people engage or don't engage and what are the appropriate norms and scripts. So you could easily imagine we might not be as shocked with say parents who are engaging with their naughty child in the supermarket with anger, and that's because the script is familiar to us, okay? But Japanese people might be quite shocked to see that American style. Um, uh, there's also really interesting variation in terms of uh, how people, what makes people angry. Um, so, um, uh, can anybody guess what the main thing, if people are just generally asked, Americans, what makes you really angry? Or what makes you angry, I should just put it that way. Politics, politics does make people angry, it's up there, yeah, yeah, politics makes people angry, yeah. Well, I, I would actually go back to Aristotle and the being slighted. Being slighted, okay, that's up there, you're right, you're right. People in a lot of places say being slighted or, uh, Americans say, wasting my fucking time. And it's important to say fucking in front of time because it's a real sense of ownership about it. So they don't just say, oh, when they waste my time, I just get a little annoyed and frustrated. No, they say those cars in front of me, the people in the Starbucks line. It's a very, it, so it's extremely, back to the first flight, it's a very entitled view. It's a very entitled view about things. Um, another sort of interesting thing is that, um, I'll come to the children's books in a second. Uh, when um, Americans are asked, uh, because almost everybody knows the following, they don't like to get angry and they feel like it upsets their equilibrium, okay? But if you ask specifically people in East Asia or uh, South Asia what sort of the personal effects of anger are, they'll say it, it disrupts relationships. Americans are much more likely to say, I get so angry at her she raises my blood pressure. It's very interesting. So really, these are huge empirical differences in the weight of different expressions that people will say. So these are quite different things. Now, one of the most important, I think, studies, this is not from uh, Bacha Mesquita's work, this is from um, uh, work by Jeannie Tsai, TSAI at Stanford. What Jeannie's been doing for many years in um, psychology is she goes on Amazon, now you can do it all over the world, and finds out what are the top 10 selling books that are given to young children in a whole bunch of different countries. So like things like Where the Wild Things Are is big in North America. Um, uh, Good Night Moon. Blueberries for Sal. I'm making these up from picturing my own kids. But anyway, but you get the idea. There's some lists that are the top 10. And by the way, these are mostly bought by grandparents. To, uh, they're the biggest, they're the, the, we're grand, the grandparents are the people who buy these things and give them on to the next generation. So what Jeannie has done is she looked into what are the emotions that are normative and that children are exposed to in these different books. So she does a lot of analysis of facial expression. And basically what she finds is that North American children's books show a face as this is the ideal face and it's kind of <laughs> that face. Um, that does not appear in any other country's children's books. <laughs> That face is not normative. A face, so that, that particular face I just showed you is called high arousal positive face. It's a high arousal emotion, right? Someone feels that way. In East Asia, South Asia, uh, it's a serene face, what's called a low arousal positive face. A calm and serene face is the ideal face. Furthermore, 
anger is authorized, or that is, it is it's expressed in those top 10 children's books as a perfectly acceptable and reasonable emotion when your aims are frustrated. Okay? So you're getting this sort of whole thing. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science. It's just sort of cultures assimilate people in certain ways, then they repeat them. There's a lot of social contagion. Generations learn from previous generations and so on. So I think these are, um, these are just some of the general findings. Now, with these two in the background, and now I'm going to go towards the last part of the talk, maybe more philosophical. Um, so given that sort of background, maybe both philosophically knowing that there are traditions which have worried a lot about anger. Like that is, even if we don't, and I certainly don't want to go to a world, I wouldn't be me if I went to a world in which there's no anger. And I'm a big, th and I believe in righteous anger, as you'll see. But if anger is causing trouble, then at least those two traditions are good places to go to to think about how you might right size your ego, how you might understand the regularities of the world better, how you might maybe learn compensatory emotions or virtues like patience, things like that. They give you some way in. The psychological findings I just talked about say, these, these possibilities are real. <laughs> They're actually instantiated right now on Earth. So you could get there if you could figure out how. Now, for philosophers, of course, we're analytic philosophers, so we like to make distinctions. And uh, so here's some distinctions that might prove useful. So one way to think about anger is both to think about zones of life in which we get angry. And then we might also want to think about the different varieties of anger itself. Like Aristotle talked about one already when you're downgraded. So here are three zones, and this is a, I think I get this mostly from Martha Nussbaum, at least the middle realm idea. So here's the idea. We all are familiar with um, anger in personal relations with family and loved ones and friends, okay? Th situations arise and we get into, uh, we have angry conflicts with those people. There's also anger in what you might call the middle realm. Um, that's in, like, if you get mad at uh, the, your cable TV people. That's a, always a good one, right? Everybody has bad relations with cable TV company or something like that. Um, but these could be any kind of commercial relation, bosses and workers, or Facebook friends, because they're not usually real friends, right? So there can be anger expressed in those zones. Um, and then there's political anger. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of all the different sorts that we're aware of. Um, so th these are three distinctions. So you might keep your eye on these. Now, here's an audience participation question, just thinking about the first one. Here's an instrumental question. When you get into those disputes with loved ones and friends, as you just sort of imagine yourself back over the course of your life, um, how often do you think when you got angry at loved ones and friends, you succeeded in getting what you wanted when you got angry. There's a thing you wanted. That's the way anger works. You wanted something. How often do you think you got it? Raise your hand if you think like you're over, you're, you, you got like a 500 batting average. Who thinks they have like a one in three times they get what they want? One in three, maybe. Yeah. One in 10? Yeah, one in 10, you're more. Well, that's a pathetic record, <laughs> when you think about it. Because if anger is supposed to serve the function of getting the people to stop downgrading you, or get out of your way, or clean the dishes, or do what they're supposed to do, and you're not getting your way usually, that's interesting, right? That's a datum that you might just say, huh, that caught my attention. I think I have to do something about this. Because in most spheres of life, you don't want to do costly behaviors. And they're costly, because they can harm relations, unless the payoff is actually fairly good. Second question, moral question. In the personal sphere, now putting aside the first answer, how often do you leave an episode of where there's been harsh words, we'll say, and you feel morally OK about yourself? Where I mean by morally OK, you didn't say things you shouldn't have said. Uh, 
Well, I see by your faces you get the problem. You often did. <laughs> I mean, the argument might have started out over sort of reasonable dispute, but then things get said. That's back to the stoic thing. It's hard to domesticate this thing. It's hard to domesticate it, to keep it, keep it on track. Anyway, the point is, this is kind of interesting because it shows, because you usually want practices to be both instrumentally useful, good for you, and you want them to be moral. They want them to produce the conditions on which we can get on with convivial social life. Anyway, that's just for you to think about. Okay, that was the zones of anger, but here now are three types. Here's some varieties of anger, and I have more than these, but because you're a mixed audience, the philosophers would be happy with my 13 different kinds of anger, but I'm only gonna tell you about a few. Okay, we already met payback anger, and payback anger is the one that Aristotle authorized, and it's where I intend, that is part of my motivation, is to cause another physical or mental pain and suffering or status harm, typically because they cause me pain. They're in my way, something like that. This is the one Aristotle seems to approve of, okay? I think this is bad. And I think it's bad for stoic reasons. I just think it's against the aim of ethics to try to make people suffer. Now that's kind of cheap and easy, so you shouldn't let me get away with it, but that's sort of like one of the things I think personally. This anger, we haven't talked about it yet, I think this is very common in the world and is really terrible, <laughs> although payback anger is also terrible, what I call pain passing anger. This is pain where I'm entitled, where I feel as if I'm entitled to cause pain to other people because I'm in pain, but not the pain, not any pain they caused. I just am hurting. So I act out my hurting because I've gotten those various permissions from authentic person movements and ventilationist movements to make your life worse because I'm feeling lousy in an angry way. I think you see this. Now sometimes the people who you see this from are truly suffering and deserve complete compassion. But I also think this is when people are rude, when people um, say nasty things to people that are passing on the subway, uh, when people are just generally annoyed and uh, cursing at people, there's a lot of this around. There's more than you think. Now, there are other kinds of anger about which I have nothing, no problem with at all. And this is back to, you were talking, back to your anger. So recognition respect anger is where I don't wish for payback. I don't want to hurt you because you disrespected me. So it's not Aristotelian in that sense. However, I have been diminished and I demand that you show respect for me as a person. I have dignity, I'm a human being, fellow human being. And I want you to do that as a way of restoring my sense of self-worth and as a signal showing me that you recognize that you shouldn't be the callous for a person who did that. It's completely ameliorative, this kind of situation I'm talking about. I'm not trying to hurt you. I may call you to account and to show me respect, but I don't mean to be hurting you. Some people say uh, that to make this kind of analysis, you need a doctrine of double effect because I will hurt your feelings when I tell you that you've hurt me badly. I will hurt your feelings, but that's not my intention. My intention is to, re to gain back my sense of my own self-worth, claim my dignity as a human being, and also ask you not to be the callous kind of person. So this seems to be fundamentally right. And then there's righteous anger. Now most people talk about righteous anger, and I sort of worry today, just because of the state of the world, I'm fine with righteous anger, actually, <laughs> okay? Uh, with it, which is, you know, what I say here, as social policies or laws or structures that are unfair, racist, sexist, or otherwise harmful or dehumanizing, largely because I think you can express your um, anger at unjust social institutions without wanting pain uh, to, uh, to have pain for the people who you're opposing, okay? That, that's not a necessary condition. However, so here, are, so here are some criticisms or just some thoughts on the way to discussion about the two kinds that I especially pick out as problematic. So, so here's some reasons why you might think that payback or pain passing anger are bad. First of all, they just prima facie don't look like very noble aim. Okay, just wanting to get back, 
we, I think we do even teach, even though we allow anger norms, pretty uh, spacious anger norms in our culture, we do teach our children not just to get revenge on people. Um, um, so it's not a particularly noble name. Uh, the other thing is that humans can and do socially cultivate and self-cultivate virtues to override natural tendencies. So Agnes Collard, uh, a very interesting philosopher at uh, Chicago, uh, she wrote an essay uh, criticizing uh, several philosophers, myself included, in the Boston uh, Review because she thinks we should just acknowledge that revenge is fun. <laughs> So she wanted to bite that bullet. I kind of get it. I mean, in other words, I'm not like, you know, I, I, I understand her point. But my response would still be, it's still not very noble. And you probably would do better to sort of overcome that particular set of desires. It will cause trouble. It is causing trouble. Um, so we are able to do that. Um, the, 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 back to what, one of the things I said at the beginning, this authenticity idea, as I said, I didn't cash it out too well, um, but if you go back and read sort of humanistic psychology of the 70s in particular, you'll see this idea all over the place that there's something in you, each one of us, called our authentic self, and it's important that we express it. So the idea is that emotions are legitimate, are legitimated because they express who I am and that I am entitled to them because I experiencing them is a modern narcissistic thought that can't pass minimal inspection. Parents never teach children that they are entitled to all their feelings. So I think this is just, uh, uh, but this, this whole authenticity idea, letting me be who I am, letting me reveal myself, I think is in the background of certain excesses we have in the anger department. And then this idea of ventilationism, so a really good book on anger by a uh, uh, psychologist named Carol Travis. Is that familiar to anyone? It's like the best book by a psychologist in the last 30 or 40 years on anger. And uh, she goes into a lot what she calls ventilationism. And ventilationism is even used in... Um, so ventilationism is the idea that you need to get your emotions out and express them, including anger. Okay, and just a healthy person gets her emotions out. Now we know back to things like Freud, you can get them out playing football. You can get them out boxing. You can get them out playing chess. Or you can, get, there's a whole bunch of ways you can get them out. You don't have to express them towards other people. But she goes into uh, the ways in which a lot of anger management, you hear about a lot of people who have to, you know, domestic offenders, violent people at home, they sometimes have to go do um, uh, anger management training. And her argument is that all the data show that that's worse, that makes people worse. It, it just gives them more permissions to express anger. And even if they're just doing it at first to the punching bag in their house, there's no lessening of the impulses and stuff. So this is a, a problem. That's why I say the research doesn't support it. Plus, ethics is not about what's good for you. It's about what is good for us. OK. And um, well, and I guess this is just finally one thing to say about righteous, say, Black Lives Matter anger, uh, um, feminist anger is that that's fine. I haven't said anything objectionable about that, but you should watch out for this, <laughs> that pain passing and uh, payback impulses get involved in the exercise. And in fact, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was very aware of this. He used to require that before civil rights marches, everybody worked to purify their souls so that they didn't want to kill the people who were blocking them crossing the bridge, or were going to bring out fire hoses. There was actually work to be done in purifying the soul so that exactly this worry, this didn't happen. So that's my small, so what I've done, so all I've done today really is to try to give you a, a sense of uh, at least a concern that I have about anger. I tried to give you, um, make some suggestions about um, where we might look, both to other cultures on Earth at this very historical time, or other 
theories, uh, philosophical theories that have followers to this day. Uh, those are two places we could look to explore varieties of moral possibility. And then I made some suggestions about a variety of types of anger, two of which I had a little bit of time to tell you I, th I, I would watch out for. Uh, and I, if we work in those areas, that might diminish the atmosphere that I see as so problematic now. Now, how we get out word from universities to people to do this, I have no idea. That's, uh, but that's a problem that we face. Uh, these are some important people in the anger debate. And uh, so here are my three recommendations. Promote the use of resources from non-Western and non-weird traditions, as well as the ones we're familiar with, uh, to critically evaluate and improve our anger practices. By the way, you could put this in for every emotion. You know, you could wonder about all the other, but anger is, uh, um, you gotta teach the children well. And uh, I think one of the things we need to do is not model um, payback and pain passing anger as much by rejecting role models, norms, and rationalizations that support them. Uh, and then finally try to minimize the degree to which payback and pain passing motivations infiltrate the couple of good kinds of anger that I think are appropriate. Thank you. Okay, folks, we have about half an hour, um, and so I ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. I'm gonna bring you this little microphone. It has like this little circle on it. Try to talk into the little circle so that the people at home can hear you. Um, and I think, uh, Professor Fleming, you're gonna try to call on people yourself, or do you want me to? I was gonna try at first. If, if people will put up their hands, then I can make a little map. I saw you first, right? If I have trouble making the map, then I'll... Do, do some people, other people want to put their hands up now so I can, okay. One, two, three. Okay, I got five, stop for now. <laughs> uh, please, yes. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so I wanted to ask, why is recognition respect anger a form of anger? Why isn't it something else like hurt or resentment or blame? What makes it anger? Um, you know, this is a really, uh, you could have your, so the question was what makes recognition, respect, anger, a form of anger. I guess I'm picturing it sort of done in the, the way you might do a kind of an Aristotle way. You can't talk to me that way. Um, where, whereas, where Aristotle approves of the anger where in saying you better not talk to me that way, I'm hurting you by something, using my authority to do that. The recognition, respect, I'm, I'm picturing it conveyed in the same way, but I guess it needn't be conveyed the same way. Like it would be conveyed angrily, but I don't want to hurt you. Right, you're making a claim on someone. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, can I, I want to use your opening comment to just make a general, uh, uh, there's a general issue in emotion science in general, uh, and we have some real experts in the room about that. So what, what falls under the concept of anger? You see, it's very complicated because is irritation a form of anger? Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, is rage a kind of anger? Most people say yes, but I know some people who say, no, nah, it's a whole different hate. Hate came up at lunch today. Hate is hate anger. So there's a lot of things. Seneca, in his thing on anger, says, the Greeks are lucky. They have 30 words for anger. We only have 15. <laughs> um, but you make a good point. I was thinking more, how about this? Um, I was saying to Piers, two examples, there, there's, there's a kind of anger which I picture, I call it feigned as if anger. The drill sergeant who yells at the troops, straighten out and fly right, he's not really angry at them. Or even the kindergarten teacher says, if you students don't behave today, there'll be no recess. He's not really angry at the kindergartners, right? But he's in the mode of angry expression. That's what I had in mind there. Um, uh, but I, these are, the semantic issues here are really complicated. Thank you. But you're right, it's a demand on another, yeah. Uh, two, I have two over there, yeah. 
Hi, um, a big part of your talk was about how kids imitate and how it's important to model our behavior so that they grow up well, um, supposedly. But uh, you also said that in the 60s we had idealistic anger and now we have more of a sloppy anger. And how do you think that when, assuming that's because the kids just picked up on the anger, ang just the anger part of it and not the ideal part of it. So how do you think that happened? Well, that's the question for the historians. Uh, <laughs> so well, let me go back to the first part of what you said. So I, I do think, uh, I mean, the historians, sociologists, anthropologists, they study social change. We do know that some things that happen, we don't have full explanations for why they happen. I don't know. You know, I talk to people about why these things happen. I think that, um, but what I do know is like, so Nicholas Christakis at uh, Yale, people may know, he's a sociologist. Um, uh, he's done a huge amount of work on what he calls social contagion. And social contagion, you know, just follows, it's very interesting, like, you know, even if you don't live near your friends, now that you're at university, you tend to have the same hairdos. People have the same habits as their friends. So there's a lot of social contagion for these things. But I think that norms and scripts of behavior are just things kids learn really early on. So my thinking about why the ideals are absent now, I don't know the answer to that. But it's not just, I mean, anger is just one part of a whole big thing, you know? And I'm just isolating that. But I don't know why that is. But I do think, I know that I'm not the only elder who's worried about the performances which you guys are consistently exposed to. I mean, you just have to read the newspapers for a week. I mean, so I, I, I told some of my students uh, uh, recently, I was talking about when politicians were public servants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see, it's a giggle producing, but, um, but that was the ideals. You see, we did think that there were people who wanted to make society better, and they were our leaders. We don't think that now. We just think they're a bunch of jokers, right? Uh, so I don't know, but um, yeah. Number five, let's see, uh, three was, I think, uh, yeah, just, oh, yeah, you, you first, you're right, yep. You don't have to run. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. Um, I really appreciate how far back in time you went. Um, and this is where I warn you, I am a medieval historian. So of course, I, I'm going to go back to some of that, because you've now also left me thinking that we are a lost cause. And part of the reason I think this is because of payback anger. Payback anger is the basis of our legal system. Uh, law came into being entirely to curb fear feuds. And that's that's something that really hasn't changed. It's about revenge. We want an eye for an eye. We want people to have to do time to pay back for what they did in their crimes. It's, it's that whole revenge notion that we can't get away from. Even in terms of something like our just war theory, which does originate with Aristotle and Kekaro and those fine guys, but then, you know, moves on with Augustine. And it's all based on revenge as well. We cannot draw first blood. If we do, we're the bad guys. It has to be about revenge. When revenge is built into our society, payback anger is what our society is built on. How do you get rid of it? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm of two minds about this, but again, uh, you know, um, so the first thing I'd say, so that was, that's very helpful. I mean, and that would be one explanation, not for why the ideals disappeared, but it'd be one explanation why this, uh, the Aristotelian authorized anger is a go-to thing and it has legs. It has cultural permissions that go way, way back. Um, and so that's why it's, it's still around. I guess, um, I don't work in this area, and there's some philosophers in the room who would uh, tell me more about this, but there are some philosophers now, I'm thinking of uh, for the philosophers in the room, Derek Paraboom and uh, Greg Caruso. They call themselves free will skeptics. Uh, they are skeptical about agency in the ways that maybe Stoics and Buddhists are skeptical too. And they think that the only 
reason for a criminal justice system would be rehabilitative or quarantine. So they have the quarantine model. The idea there would be that, well, instead of killing Hitler, I could have locked him up forever because he's just too dangerous to let out. But the idea would be, so some of those discussions, now I don't know how far they go in criminal justice, that would be the area that I would need to know more about, whether you can unseat Americans' strong attachment to the payback view. I don't know. I was very surprised last week, or two weeks ago when the war started in the Middle East, that there was immediate talk about re revenge. The word was out there uh, early in the discussions. I was surprised at that, but I'm very naive sometimes. So, do you know what I mean? I mean, so, but, but this is a nice analysis of why, but it, and it would go along with what Agnes Collard says, but doesn't the revenge, feel, doesn't it feel good sometimes to zap the person back? And it does. It does. But again, th these are the kind of compromises that sometimes living a communal human life require that we just have to say that some of our natural impulses are not for the best and we need to work collectively to overcome them. But that's helpful, uh, although it's not edifying in the sense of <laughs> we see the end, uh, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Although I don't know what, well, I think America though is especially, in terms of the carceral state, we are kind of unique in the world though in having that attitude, isn't that right? Well, and we also don't really work on rehabilitation. No, we don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that would go back to, again, a like nice Stoic arguments because the Stoics kept, they, they kept trying to, undermine Aristotle in his own terms. They say, look, you're the one who says that ethics aims for the good. So if you want to get mad at this person for not doing their chores, well, sure, you can get mad in an as-if way. That's fine. The kids will comply. Or you can get mad in a recognition respect way, which is just saying, you're part of this family. Step up and do your chores. Right? Those are all be fine, but the, the revenge just because it feels good doesn't mean it is good. Uh, I'll get to you in one second. I, I'm doing so good so far with the numbers here. Okay, and then Justin, yeah, you're next. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to, to suggest something and see if you find it tolerable or not. Um, it, it seems to me as though what you're calling payback anger is something like a natural psychological force of a certain sort that we find occurring in lots and lots of places over lots and lots of times. And, uh, and you warn us against letting it infiltrate other species of anger. And I think that that's a, a helpful and sensible warning. But I wonder if sort of the reason why it has a tendency to infiltrate other forms of anger is because, to speak to the question that, that she started us off with, it, that's part of what anger is. Um, so anger involves a kind of energy in a retaliatory direction. And we can do a lot of things to control it and, uh, and try to make ourselves express it in more useful ways, to try to make ourselves not express it, even though we have it, um, to try to. Uh, but sort of the reason why payback anger has a nasty tendency to sneak into more positive forms of anger is because insofar as they really are anger, there's, there, there is already that kind of labile psychological energy in the direction of retaliation. And, and if there were no tendency toward infiltration, it would be because we aren't really talking about anger, we're talking about something else. I hear you. Yeah, so the, that's very helpful. Yeah, so I think, and there have been a couple of comments that made me think along the same lines, right? So uh, this is something actually someone like Justin works on and I'm interested in it too. I mean, many, many, you know, most of us who work in ethics and philosophy of mind nowadays think, well, you know, we have to explain whatever, you know, the question I started out with. If we could only figure out what is human nature like deep down inside beneath this close of culture, that would be interesting because then we'd have a fix on certain universal characteristics. 
And we need to think about the origin and the original function of these, so as psychological entities. And you just might say, look it. Anger had to be really, like fear is very valuable. You head for the hills when there's danger. But anger is also really valuable because when resources were really scarce and you start to walk up to my pile of stuff or my spouse or whatever, then I'm gonna first give you the evil eye to push you off. But the evil eye promises something. It promises that they'll be held to pay if you continue in this action. So depending on how you think about the natural contours of the original phenotypic trait, as they would say, it just might be that it's that sort of thing. So you'd have to domesticate it so much that it wouldn't be anger anymore. That's part of the, that would be a consequence of something you said, right? Maybe, you domesticated so much. For, yeah, and then there, well, good. That's just a very helpful way of thinking about it. Um, I, the only challenge I could see from the data that I presented is, what do you want to say about the Japanese mother case? So, uh, I, I'd love to know more about the Japanese mother case, but I, but I did find it puzzling. I mean, that, that, that is, I mean, I, I know about disappointment, and I can imagine responding to my child's anger with disappointment rather than with anger, and that seems like a totally coherent possibility. But when we say like, oh, but it's anger, but you, but the way that you experience anger is as a withdrawal emotion, then I think, well, is it that you uh, suppress the temptations to do the things that anger motivates, and, and you've been socialized into not thinking those acceptable ways to behave, or or is it really somehow anger that makes you want to go and withdraw? And, and, and that possibility, I, I struggle to understand without more context. So, right, and uh, the, the the data are not uh, all that rich. I wondered about it too, so here's, here's an interesting thing. So just following up on what Justin's saying, the Japanese mothers, remember, the child is angry, it's having a temper tantrum or is throwing something, okay? The mother doesn't engage angrily. Now she could be doing that as a matter of policy. They learned that extinction works better than punishment or attention. So they just do it as a matter of policy. But it relates to the following sort of question. Are there stimuli which automatically or ballistically engage your anger mechanism? And the answer really, that seems again something that you're gonna learn, it's gonna be a lot of social learning, right? If you just, I mean, there's a philosopher who the philosophers in the room all know, Peter Strawson says that we're always engaging our emotional attitudes, but with children and he'll sometimes say the insane, but we move to the objective attitude. That's easy to do. We just don't treat them like full on. The kid isn't trying to destroy the house on purpose. Okay, um, and so we can we can deploy the objective attitude. So it, it, it's not a perfect case of where there's a reason that everyone will agree that's sort of like in the wiring that'll get you angry. Like a snake, you know, we're taking a hike. I see a snake. I say a snake, and we head for the hills. It turns out to be, I don't know, a shoelace. Okay, but you get the idea. It's wired to get right away from stakes. Um, are there things that automatically, sort of the way we're wired, make us want to feel that kind of anger that you're talking about? Maybe kids doing that isn't one of them. But again, downgrading me might be one. I don't know, thank you. Uh, someone behind, just, yes please. Were you the, were you the, did you, someone else over there had their hand up too? If you did, put your hand up again, if anyone over there. I have a random number. Okay, please. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating um, talk. And I guess my question uh, is first, you know, and I'll tell you the, the thought process behind it. Can anger be ethical? or morally right, it's not, not righteous, but right, correct, good even. And I'm thinking about this uh, because, you know, you did say, you know, uh, anger in before, like in the 60s, 70s, was in many ways hopeful perhaps, perhaps? and you showed some examples, right? Um, 
And then you said that anger today is um, seems sloppy and perhaps because um, the hope is gone. And I'm saying this also with the background of, um, you know, I'm a millennial and I think that n my generation and generations, younger generations are also experiencing a lot of anger uh, with the state of the world, with politics, with a lot of, you know, with our futures, right? And so I see, or, you know, in many ways, perhaps my generation and younger generation see anger as an avenue for changing things, for betterment. And in that sense, for instance, just, just uh, an example, I'm an immigrant in the country, and the only reason why I became a citizen, because I could have remained a permanent resident, was because I was angry about who was running uh, uh, last election, not this election, last election and I became a citizen because out of anger to be able to participate and to vote and I think that my generation and younger generations do a lot of things out of that anger and I think the anger is based on perhaps the loss of hope that we saw that we see in the world um, so can and you said that anger could not be wielded in many ways but does anger change has it changed can it be wielded now wielded now um, and in that sense, can it be an avenue for betterment or good, or could it be ethical in today's time? Yes, so good, thanks. So the general sort of uh, background assumption of my entire talk is something like this. Most of you probably have heard of Paul Ekman's uh, theory about the emotions that are allegedly universally expressed on human faces. Uh, Bill Reddy, who's a Duke person, he'll come here next week and complain about the, the but, but here's one idea that's out there. It's a famous idea uh, that, and it's an, actually an interesting story in the history of science. So Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, was a um, believer in extreme relativity of emotions. She thought there was probably huge emotional, like maybe you find cultures they don't even experience like sadness and anything like we do, and other ones that do, and so on. So she had a, a student named Paul Ekman, and she said to Paul, uh, go and disprove Darwin's hypothesis, because in 1871 and 72, in a book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, Darwin had hypothesized that there were universal facial expressions. And Ekman went off around the world and uh, uh, tested the Darwinian hypothesis, and he came back, and by the 70s, he was writing articles in Science and Nature, explaining that it looked pretty clear that for seven emotions, there's characteristic movement of the facial musculature, and those emotions are surprise, happy, sad, scared, angry, disgust, and contempt. It's interesting. The argument was that inside a culture, you can read on someone's face usually, if they're in one of those states, you usually can pick it out. But there are what are called cultural display roles that make it harder if I go into, if I go to Korea, say, to exactly detect, right? Um, I'm a native New Yorker, new native New Yorkers, like, do them big, <laughs> okay. Um, so one idea was that these are just very, this is kind of primitive equipment. It comes like being like it's bipedal, like being bipedal. It just comes with the stuff that we have. But then the question is like, how robust are any of these emotions? And I think the answer is they need to be filled out by a culture and they can be filled out in a whole bunch of different ways. So whereas initially the snake, cause, the, the snake causes me to be scared, sure, that makes sense, or a spider, okay? But eventually the economy can scare me because I might lose my job. That requires huge amounts of social institutions, an understanding of how social institutions work. And you know, I, I remember when, um, when COVID hit, both my adult children lost their jobs right away. And at the time, I was uh, at a meeting with uh, some people at the United Nations, uh, the president of Finland, and she and I were talking. And she, it was just so clear, if my kids, luckily my kids have a social safety net, it's called me. <laughs> So I took care of them during that time and got them health insurance. But she was pointing out that children in my children's situation would not have felt scared and precarious in Finland. 
Okay? So they weren't scared of losing their job. In America, they were right to be scared of losing their job, and they did lose them. Luckily, they had me. A lot of people didn't have someone who could afford to help them out. But in other countries, it's different. So, there, so precarity might not be as much of a reason in one place. It might be more of a reason in other. Political corruption will be more of a reason sometimes than others for anger. Anger is clearly motivationally, it's very, a, it's very common. <laughs> it's, it can serve good causes. But how we do it, it can be cruel. It can be a cruel emotion. And it can be counterproductive. So those are the kind of things. So, the, But your, the answer to your question is exactly. You're a good example of anger motivated you to do something noble. So good. Glad you did that. I wonder who you voted for. <laughs> other, I, that was my first five people. Who, any other hands? OK, I got it. Yeah. Uh, over here, yeah. Um, hi, so um, thank you for this. This was really interesting. Uh, I have a clarificatory question about your um, authenticity point, where um, it's a narcissistic assumption that um, we're entitled to express our emotions. And um, it seems plausible to me that I am entitled to express some emotions, some positive ones that aren't anger, like perhaps um, shared love or joy. Um, and it also seems very plausible that I am not entitled to express payback anger or pain passing anger. And so um, my question is, if you've given any thought to where that line is, if there is one, um, is it limited to anger and specific kinds of anger? Is it limited to uh, other kinds of ugly emotions? And, and how ugly does an emotion have to be such that we're no longer entitled to express it to others? OK, that's good. really good questions that I invited by things I said. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know how to answer exactly. Let's start this way. So um, in general, probably all emotions, on most views, I think this is fair. Correct me if I'm wrong. Involve disposition. They feel a certain way, but they also involve dispositions to behave. So when you're sad, you could feel sad without crying, but feeling sad and tears often go together. Anger and harsh words can often go together. Um, uh, fear and getting out of, getting away from the, um, so there's, so in all those cases that I've mentioned so far, right, the feeling is appropriate and the behavior is appropriate. Um, so there'll be a lot of instances like that, it seems, that would be um, both psychologically acceptable and morally just fine. What I had in mind here was a certain view that goes, that gives the self permission to feel whatever way I feel about pretty much anything and claim, A, that it's my right to feel that way, and B, it's also my right to convey to you that I don't like what's. So I'm trying to think of a good example um, without getting personal. Um, what I have in mind is something like um, a person who says, uh, I don't know, imagine a friend who says to you, whenever we go out with Bob and Jane and you, I always feel like you pay more attention to them than to me. And then I say sincerely back, I don't <laughs> pay more attention to them than to you. Get over it. I mean, if I say it that way, it might not be the most effective. You get the idea, right? <laughs> I'm having to shorten my very 
skillful interpersonal <laughs> qualities. <laughs> but I kind of call upon you just not to feel that way because it doesn't match reality. This is, by the way, is the therapies of desire that both Stoics and uh, Buddhists have involve correcting false views that people have about themselves. So sometimes it would be a false view that, you're, that the universe should make it so there's no lines at coffee shops for you or that there's no traffic on the road. So it's a false belief. You can just say, get over it. There's always traffic. So, you know. So, in the, so the, 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 the idea that I'm thinking of is a person has a feeling. The feeling doesn't even, isn't plausibly responsive to the way things are. And then my feeling is I should be able to legitimately respond. So A, don't feel that way. And don't complain after we go out with those other people that I was paying more attention to them than to you because I wasn't. But then it keeps happening, and you keep saying, but I still feel that way. That's the kind of thing that, so there's this, I don't know if other people are, were any of the elders in the room familiar with the situation I'm talking about? You know, it's just kind of like, whatever my feelings are, I just, that is who I am, here I am. And they're not sort of answerable to the facts, I think. And it's thought to be a healthy thing to just be whoever you are. That's sort of the extreme view, version of the view. Does that make sense? I think that's so, yeah. so, helpful. Then Abe had a question. Oh, sorry. I don't want to make anybody angry by going over time. Um, so I think actually we probably have to call it there. Sorry, Abe. Um, but uh, let's all just please join me in thanking Professor Frank.